And Lewis and Miles would like to thank you for your support in prayer and for your kind and thoughtful cards and flowers during the last week. Um, and I think, is there going to be a picture on the screen just now for the notices? Yes. Um, at various points uh, over the last years, various groups have asked, could we have some small groups doing kind of Bible study thing? So Kim and I have tried to plan this discipleship explored. It's tried and tested. Um, it's from Christianity Explored. There'll be a little trailer video um, next week um, about it. Um, I think the first thing is, if you're interested, so that we can gauge who might be interested in doing this, um, just to get in touch with me by the 1st of October, and then we can work out how best we're going to do it. I think it's going to have to be on Zoom. I think the possibilities for meeting up in person really are going to be um, very, very restricted. Um, so I think this will have to be on Zoom. Um, it's eight weeks and it's looking through Paul's letter to the Philippians and there'll be more information next week. But if you're at all interested, just drop me an email or get in touch by the 1st of October. At the start of our service this morning, we're going to hear some words from Paul's letter to the Romans, written to church congregations gathered in different parts of the city, in different people's houses and different places, and drawing people to God and to trust in him and the things that are key to our faith as we live among one another. And Jan Reed is reading this morning, and this will be um, on a video, Romans chapter 12 and verses 9 to 13. Don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Stand on the side of the good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and always be prayerful. When God's children are in need, be the one to help them out and get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or, if they need lodging, for the night. God longs for us to flourish, even in the difficult times just now, like that sunflower. And Paul wrote to those gathered Christians in Rome, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And God promises that he will meet with us, whether we're here in the building or we're at home. So let's just take a moment to be still and draw near to God in our prayers. Loving God, we thank you that you are with us and you long for us to flourish as your people. Here as we worship, fill us with your hope. Give us your patience and help us to draw near to you in prayer and in worship. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing. At home you can sing aloud. Um, in the church we'll just have to listen. As we worship God together, drawing us to the hope we have in Jesus. My Jesus, my Saviour.
So let us pray together. And in the building, we, we can at the end of this prayer join in just softly in the Lord's Prayer together. Lord our God, with all your creation, we thank you and praise you. God who brought your good world into being, we praise you. God of these sunlit autumn days, we praise you. Lord of our lives, we praise you and we worship you. We thank you that you promise that you understand us and you know us because you've come among us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we come together to worship now, we pray that you will meet with us. And when we go into the rest of this day, help us to know that you're our refuge and our strength. And nothing else that we face compares to the promise that we have in you. Lord, you promise that you love us so much you've given us your son. You promise that you will go ahead of us. You promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you're in the midst of us. In your peace, in your power, in your forgiving love. Lord, you draw near to us in the love of Jesus. And we ask now for your forgiveness for ways in which we have hurt you or hurt others. And in the quiet, we reflect on the last days and weeks and how we've been living our lives. And we reflect on your love and your perfection. And Lord, we're sorry when we haven't matched up to all you've wanted us to be. You know and we know these times and these moments. So because you love us so much in Jesus, we come and ask for your forgiveness now. Cleanse us and help us to make a new start. Help us now to begin this week with you. And as we think over the things that are planned for this week, the things that may come unexpectedly, we ask for your love in the Holy Spirit to fill us, your guidance and your help. And this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us and we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Hosea. But before we hear that, Kim, our youth worker, who's already been doing fun and chat with um, children um, at 10.30 this morning, Kim has recorded this little video, um, an introduction to Hosea and the message of God's love for us and God's call for us to love others. Kim. Hi everyone. What does loving and caring for somebody look like? How would they? A parent hugging their small child, taking care of a loved one when they're sick, a text message to a friend, a phone call, a video call with someone around the world, following the social distance guidance. Each day we can people showing love and care for others. What does the Bible say about how God loves and cares for us? Let's look at the story of Hosea. Many years before Hosea was born, God had shown his love for Israel by rescuing them from Egypt, protecting them in the wilderness, in the land of Israel. God patiently taught Israel to walk, how to live and lead them on the right path. Israel wasn't grateful. They could not see God was at work. 
In this story, we see God's great care for his people. He is always there for them, watching them, protecting them, and caring for them. He loves and cares for them, even though they rejected him. God's love is described as a father looking after and caring for his children. We are all different, but we are all a child of God. When I was thinking about this image, I couldn't help but think about a dog looking after its puppy and taking care of them, teaching them lessons of how to walk and run. Puppy does something wrong, teaches them the right way, and always loves them and takes care of them, protecting them from danger, loving them no matter what. The story in Jose teaches us that God is always there for us, loving and caring and protecting us. And even if we stray away from God, he will always be there, and we are all part of God's family. This week, think of how you can show God's love and care to someone in your life. Now let us pray. God, thank you that you love and care for us, and help us to remember this each day. Amen. Thank you, Kim, and God's amazing love for us. And one way in which we can share that with others. We're going to hear now a little bit from the book Kim was mentioning, Hosea. Now, last week, we were thinking about that beautiful um, 3D banner that's down in the New Hall of God's people going through the desert, the people of Israel, and God protecting them and providing for them like an eagle. And there's such richness in that banner that I thought we would look at three different aspects from it in the next weeks. One, God's care for the people. And then the next one, the journey that the people are on. And then in a couple of weeks' time, at harvest, the land and what that means. So God's care for the people. That's what the book of Hosea really is about in this passage we're going to hear. We fast forward over 500 years from the Exodus and the people coming out of Egypt and in the desert. And here, God speaks to the people of Israel of his love and protection and goes back to that image of God protecting and leading the people out of Egypt. So Jan Reed is going to read again for us, and it's Hosea chapter 11 and verses 1 to 11. The second reading is from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. The Lord's love for Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him as a son, and I called my son out of Egypt. But the more I called to him, the more he rebelled, offering sacrifices to the images of Baal and burning incense to idols. It was I who taught Israel how to walk, leading him along by the hand. But he doesn't know or even care that it was I who took care of him. I led Israel along with my ropes of kindness and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck and I myself stooped to feed him. But since my people refuse to return to me, they will go back to Egypt and will be forced to serve Assyria. War will swirl through their cities. Their enemies will crash through their gates and destroy them, trapping them in their own evil plans. For my people are determined to desert me. They call me the Most High, but they don't truly honour me. Oh, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I let you go? How can I destroy you like Adma and Zeboim? My heart is torn within me, and my compassion overflows. No, I will not punish you as much as my burning anger tells me to. I will not completely destroy Israel, for I am God and not a mere mortal. I am the Holy One living among you, and I will not come to destroy. For someday 
the people will follow the Lord. I will roar like a lion, and my people will return trembling from the west. Like a flock of birds, they will come from Egypt. Flying like doves, they will return from Assyria. And I will bring them home again, says the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray that now you will help us to understand it and its place in our lives today and at this moment. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just hear again some of those beautiful words from Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Whatever is going on in your life, may these ancient words speak to you that God loves you. When Israel was a child, I loved him. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking him by the arms, Ephraim, another name for Israel. However hard the journey of your life, may these ancient words speak to you that God will help you walk the journey. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking him by the arms, I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. However hard the challenges, or difficult the people, or issues in your life, may these ancient words speak to you that God loves you tenderly. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. And how can I give you up? For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. If you ever think that you're beyond the reach of God's love, may these ancient words speak to you of the God who loves you and searches for you. How can I give you up? For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. It's almost, well, it's more than almost, a description of Jesus' love on the cross and of his invitation that we heard two weeks ago in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and eat with them. They're words not just for an individual, but for people. The words of Hosea to build up the people of God. And now we've got a photograph, hopefully. Yes. More sunflowers. An update on the sunflowers from last week. Last week we had one flower in uh, the sunflower that the birds had dropped by the bird feeder, and now there are two flowers and a little one on the way that's a little bit further down. I don't know what the collective word for sunflowers is. Is it a display of sunflowers? Is it a heat wave of sunflowers? This picture makes me like to think it's a family of sunflowers. The church is the people. We've probably known that more than we have for a long time over these last months when the building has been closed and the things that we've usually done we can't do. The church is the people. But what of the future for the people of God? And there's another slide in a minute. Those words from Romans remind us of the hope that God has for his people. 
Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Thinking of those sunflowers on our um, gravel, how vulnerable they are. The amount of things that could have quashed them. Birds eating the seeds, or the sunshine in May wilting them, or the huge amount of rain we had in August just smothering them, or me driving over them with a car, or rolling over them with a lawnmower. All these different things, or even the winds of Storm Ellen, all these things made them vulnerable, but yet there they are, and they speak to me of hope for God's people, the family of God's people, when we are joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Hope for the people of God who loves us, takes us by the arm, draws us with ties of love, and cannot give us up. For the people of God, as for people everywhere, these are tough times. I've heard people say at various times, and read it too, that this is really difficult for the church. When we get out of the habit of coming to the church building, will people ever come back? Will the church ever be the same? Will the church survive? It's hard in almost every aspect. It's hard to keep in contact with people. We miss the contact and that's really hard just to keep going um, with the phone calls and the emails and the contact because it means so much. It's hard with youth work. It's hard with just all the different things of church life. But is COVID-19 the biggest threat to the people of God? I may be naive, but I don't think COVID-19 is the biggest threat to the church or the people of God. I'm convinced that God can and will enable us to keep going, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. I'm convinced that God could even help us to grow as, as a church. I think the biggest risk, and this is throughout Scripture, is, for, is when the people of God forget that they are the people of God. I think the biggest risk to the church is when the people of God do not see the whole picture. So we have the next picture. Um, please, that would be great. And there it is. The whole picture of the people of God. The people and God like the eagle above. He protected them and cared from them, for them, we thought in Deuteronomy chapter 32 last week. So the next picture. When we focus just on ourselves, then we're only seeing half the picture. And that's the danger. When you just see half the picture, what happens? Well, in the story of the Exodus, what happened to the people of God when they forgot that they belonged to God? Well, they moaned. They moaned about, we don't have any food, so God gave them food. They got manna in the wilderness, and then they moaned. All we ever have to eat is manna. We're absolutely fed up to the back teeth of manna. They moaned. When they forgot the whole picture, they griped away at Moses, the leader God had given them. When they forgot the whole picture, they just kept going back to the past and thought, we wish we were back in Egypt, forgetting the horror and misery of all these years of slavery. When the people of God forget the whole picture and forget God, they stop being the people of God, become inward looking. And the context of Hosea, 500 odd years later, the people of God had forgotten the whole picture. The Hosea, in a nutshell, is really God's wake-up call to the people of Israel and saying, 
the root of your problems just now is that you've forgotten me. You're ignoring your relationship with me. So what was happening was their king, Jeroboam II, was getting victories in battle, but the people were suffering. And what was happening was people were going up to, um, to worship at Gilgal or Bethel, and they were going to the elders at the city gate and asking for justice in their disputes. And they weren't getting it. They were just getting rubbish. And the people of God were going up to worship, but most of their mind was in trying to please the local fertility god, Baal. They'd forgotten the whole picture. And they weren't the people of God anymore. And that's the big risk. And we see that, of course, in the history of the church. The church is at its least effective when it becomes inward looking and squabbles amongst itself. Think of just the history of the church and the different wars caused by religion and the different disputes and how that hampers the church and what that makes people outside think. Gosh, if you can't even agree with one another, what's the point? But what God wants is for us to flourish. So the next uh, picture, I've got two pictures of flourishing in community. Just the horses free to be the, peop the, the creatures that God made them to be. And another one that's perhaps even nicer, the sheep enjoying life. Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. To live for God. Fulfilled lives. And that's in the context of Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. You've got to see the whole picture. God's helping us to live life to the full. There are probably lots of things we're getting wrong just now in the church and in our own church here. But just think of what God has enabled us to do, to keep in contact with one another. The very thought that Lindsay Union is live streaming and people can watch having a cup of coffee at home. Do you know, who would have thought that? The things that God enables us to do to live life to the full as the church. I don't think it's COVID-19 that's the danger for the church. The danger, the threat to the church is what it's always been for the people of God. When they don't see the whole picture and forget that God is watching over and that God is our shepherd. So, go into the week ahead, people of God, seeing the whole picture. And that way, we will have the strength and the courage to face whatever lies ahead. Let these ancient words remind you of how much you are loved by God. When Israel was a child, I loved him. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking him by the arms. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. How can I give you up? For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. And then the next slides. That way will be the people that God created us to be. And the next one. Trusting in God who carries us. And the next one.
There's the picture. Resilience. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. The people of God in the hollow of God's hand, trusting for whatever is ahead. Go into the week ahead knowing that God goes ahead of you knowing that he loves you. And here's the thing, that challenge that Kim gave us. If God loves us so much, like the dog looking after the puppy, then to be the people of God, how are we going to show that love and kindness to those around us? What one thing could we do? One thing we could bite off this week that would make a difference in the lives of others. Hope for the people of God. Hope from the people of God. God calls us as his people because we're precious to him, precious to one another. I'm going to finish with a poem, and thanks to Jan McMeekin who sent it to me um, through the week. It was written by um, a Norwegian, but John Bell has arranged it and set it to music, and maybe we'll hear it sung another week. The people of God, in the hope of God. We will meet when the danger is over. We will meet when the sad days are done. We will meet sitting closely together and be glad our tomorrow has come. We will join to give thanks and sing gladly. We will join to break bread and share wine, and the peace that we pass to each other will be more than a casual sign. So let's make with each other a promise that when all we've come through is behind, we will share what we've missed and find meaning in the things that once troubled our mind. Until then, may we always discover faith and love to determine our way. That's our hope and our calling for our lives and for every new day. Amen. So, as the people of God, dearly loved and led by God that ties he cannot break, we think, how will we serve him as his people in the world now? With hope and with love. At home, you can sing, and the church will just need to listen. Longing for light, we wait in darkness.
Let us pray. Eternal God, God who is eternal but who is always present, present with people in the past in their journeys as recorded in the scriptures, and present in the here and now of our moment in worship, grant to us a sense of your living, abiding, eternal presence, that wherever, wherever we are in our life's journey, you are there. We thank you for those who have given witness to this through the ages, for those who have kept safe our scriptures, gathered our songs, built our sanctuaries, and we thank you for the great community of faith into which you have brought us. Help us, we pray, in our time to give living witness to this eternal truth that this generation and generations to come will know of your abiding eternal love. We pray for a society much in need of this message. Into the confusion of our times, speak your word. Into the fears of our times, speak your assurance. Into the temptations of our times, speak your truth. Into the waywardness of our times, show your path. Into our darkness, let your light shine. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. And shine, shine, shine on me. May each one of us sing this refrain. Shine, shine on me. And through the faith of individuals, may others come to believe. And through the life and witness of the church, may lives be redeemed and society healed of brokenness. We pray for the church in this mission. Guide it in the challenge of our times. May its faith, hope, and love never fail, for it is rooted in the eternal God of ages who cannot fail. We pray for our community here in Lindsay and beyond. We pray for families, especially for those facing a crossroads in decision, young people pursuing studies, the employed and unemployed contemplating a career change, doctors and patients considering medical options, teachers and students wrestling with the challenge of our times, the lonely elderly, wondering when this isolation will end. The bewildered, which is all of us, grant to us a trusting spirit in you, our God, who leads his people. And grant to all of us a special compassion and care for those who suffer. We bring before you, O oh God, our suffering world. So many situations of conflict, of hunger, of poverty, of fear. Right our wrongs, we pray, and may peace and prosperity abound and earth's riches more equally shared. We pray for Christians in places of, in the world who suffer persecution Protect them, we pray, and may perpetrators repent of the ill that they do. Finally, God who is eternal, go with us, we pray, into this coming week. Teach us what we need to know and learn. May we have courage to live as you call us to live and change where change is needed. And may we have grace to exhibit Christ's likeness in all that we say and do. 
We pray for those nearest and dearest to us. Guide them in the choices they make. And may they know your will and find joy and fulfillment in doing it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Donald, and thank you for being here today and for watching with us at, at home. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain upon you today and always. Amen. As we go on our way, um, the hymn that we didn't quite hear last week, Great is Thy Faithfulness. See you.